well, we'll just turn back to the original Marxism and we'll say, well, we'll just, ident we'll just group ourselves up in oppressed groups and we'll have wars between the oppressed groups. That'll give us a sufficient overarching narrative. It doesn't matter that it contradicts the postmodernist thesis because they don't care about contradictions. So, well, so, so. hence this you know, <laughs> feminist glaciology. Okay, so I've got a few questions. I've been watching hands pop up. So there's one back there first. Okay, uh, Felix? Uh, so as far as I can tell, you, you, you created um, um, a conflict, or rather a describing conflict, really between determinism and choice, right? That you know, present a psychological and biological determinism with that the matter is the women, different you know, you know, based on different strata psychological structures. And on the other hand, there's the idea of gender choice or identity choice. In the, there is choice that we can make go beyond our determinist functions. And it's a good, it's a good. Am I, am I getting that right? No, it's a, good, it's a good question. No, I don't think so. Even though I think your question is well formulated and intelligent, I, I don't think it's that, that dichotomy is that straightforward. Because there is a tremendous amount of deterministic thinking on the social justice warrior end of the distribution too, because they regard you as the deterministic product of your environment. So it's more like the localization of determinism. So you, you might say that for the, biolog for the more biologically oriented people, there's more biological determinism. But then, so, so I, I think that the, the, the conflict between free will and determinism basically runs across the entire political spectrum. But then I would also say it's probably an ill-formed argument, because there isn't an absolute paradoxical contradiction between free will and determinism. Quite the contrary. You actually need elements of determinism, I think, for a system to operate freely. So, for example, think about playing chess. You can do a lot of things when you're playing chess. Or think about composing music. You can do a lot of things when you're composing music. But there's an underlying rule structure that, that sets up the, the, uh, the environment within which all of those choices manifest themselves. It's the same with online video games, which... which which are a really good example, I think, because they are micro-worlds. And they're determined in some sense because they have an underlying rule structure. That's the rules of the game. But they're free in many other ways. And so, I don't think there's anybody, pretty much, on any side of the political spectrum who would regard people as entirely possessed of free will. You know, we have constraints and limits. And we're also pretty good at adjusting those on the fly. You know, so, for example, You'll be much less irritated if a three-year-old runs into you carelessly while tricycling than you will if a, you know, an adult man runs into you with his scooter. Because you'll, you'll, you'll take the constraints of the individual into account very, very rapidly. So, I think, so well, so that's, it's not as simple as free will versus determinism mapped onto the political spectrum. Okay, sorry, sorry, Joey? When you mentioned that if somebody thought that like socialism was, was done wrong because it was done by Stalin, um, that frequently they're saying that well I would have done it right, and that and then uh, that there's some there's something wrong with that person, and um, I see what you're saying, but I wonder I also heard you say once in a video about twisted compassion, mm -hmm. about how people get their compassion all twisted, mm -hmm. and that. Uh, you appeal to it in the individual. It seems that like attacking on that level, not that you, that's not your your mojo, that's not yep. how you do things really, but it, it seems like it'll get people on their heels, sort of. You know, I see like some hatred for Americanism or something like this, or, or Muslims, and, and I think that just makes people, they naturally feel identified with like their land or their category. It'll just make them defend that, that stance even more, instead oh. of reaching for the individual like understanding some kind of like, compassion. Okay, so I, I have to take that apart a little bit, because there's a bunch of issues in the question. Um, how many people in here are in your psychology course, or taking psychology? Are most of you taking psychology courses? How many people are taking psychology courses? Okay, so a goodly number. Well, one of the things you want to do with, with a conception like compassion is you actually want to start thinking about it like a psychologist or like a scientist, because compassion is actually definable, and it... I think the easiest way to approach it is to think about it in big five terms, because it, it maps onto agreeableness. And especially, you can break agreeableness down into compassion and politeness. 
And the liberal types, especially the, the social justice types, are way higher in compassion. It's actually their, their fundamental characteristic. And you might think, well, compassion is, is a virtue. It's like, yes, it is a virtue. But any unidimensional virtue immediately becomes a vice. Because real virtue is the intermingling of a number of virtues and their, and their integration into a functional identity that can be expressed socially. And compassion, compassion is great if you happen to be the entity towards which it is directed. But compassion tends to divide the world into uh, crying children and predatory snakes. Right, and so if you're a crying child, hey, great, man, but if you happen to be identified as one of the predatory snakes, you better look the hell out. And so, you know, compassion is what the mother grizzly bear feels for her cubs when she eats you because you got in the way. Right, exactly. So no, we don't want to be thinking for a second that compassion isn't a, uh, a virtue that could lead to violence, because it certainly can. And the other problem with compassion this is why we have conscientiousness, right? There's five canonical personality dimensions. Agreeableness is pretty good if you're dealing, again, in a kin system. You want to distribute resources equally, for example, among your children, because you want all of them to have not only the same chance, you even want them roughly to have the same outcome, a good one. But the problem is, is you can't extend that moral network to larger groups, not as far as I can tell. You need conscientiousness, which is a much colder virtue. And it's also a virtue that's much more concerned with larger structures over the longer period of time. So, and you can think about conscientiousness as a form of compassion too. It's a strange form. It's like, straighten the hell out and work hard and your life will go well. It's like, I don't care how, your feelings, how you feel about that right now. And, and like someone who's cold, low in agreeableness, say, and high in conscientiousness, that's what they'll tell you every time. Don't, don't come whining to me. I don't care about your hurt feelings. Do your goddamn job or you're going to be out on the street. You think, oh, that person's being really hard on me. It's like, not necessarily. They might have your long-term best interest in mind. And you're fortunate if you come across someone who's, like, not tyrannically disagreeable, but moderately disagreeable and high in conscientiousness because they'll whip you into shape. And that's really helpful. I mean, you, you'll admire people like that. You won't be able to help it. You know, and you think, oh, wow, this person's actually giving me good information, even though, you know, you feel like a slug after, you, <laughs> after they've taken you apart. So, okay, so that's the compassion issue. It's like you can't just transform that into a political stance. And I think part of what we're seeing is actually the rise of a form of female totalitarianism. Because we have no idea what totalitarianism would be like if women ran it, because that's never happened before in the history of the planet. And so we've introduced women into the political sphere radically over the last 50 years. We have no idea what the consequence of that is going to be, but we do know from our research, which is preliminary, that um, agreeableness really predicts political correctness, but female gender predicts over and above the personality trait, and that's something we found very rarely in our research. Usually the sex differences are wiped out by the personality differences, but not in this particular case. And then, you know, women are getting married or later, and they're having children much later, and they're having fewer of them. And so you also have to wonder what their feminine orientation is doing with itself in the interim, roughly speaking. And a lot of it's being expressed as political opinion. Like, it's fair enough, you know, that's, that's fine. But it's not fine when it starts to shut down discussion. You know, also, if you think about politi politics from a temperamental perspective, it, it gets to be extraordinarily useful. So, if you're conservative, you're high in conscientiousness, particularly orderliness, and you're low in openness. Okay, so what good are you? Well, you're not great if you ought to have a wonderful philosophical conversation about ideas and then go hit an art movie. It's like, no, conservatives, you're wrong, wrong date for that particular bit of business. But if you want someone to run a company that's already been established, or to make sure that algorithmized processes are being undertaken properly, you want conservatives. They're very good at managing, and they're very good at administering. Conscientiousness is the best predictor of those two domains, apart from IQ. Okay, so fine. What do you need the damn liberals for? Well, you don't want them running anything, <laughs> but you want them thinking up new things. Because the entrepreneurs and artists are, are high in openness, 
and low in conscientiousness, especially orderliness. And they have to be, because if you're starting something new, you don't want to have everything in the neat little boxes. You have to break rules. You have to take things apart. And so the liberals need the conservatives to run enterprises, and the conservatives need the liberals to start them. And it makes sense from a temperamental perspective, if you think about it, too, because there's five basic personality dimensions. They're all normally distributed. And what that implies is that there's a niche for every personality type in proportion to the frequency of the, of the occurrence within that normal distribution. There's some places for really extroverted people. There's more places for people who are moderately extroverted and moderately introverted. But there are places for everyone in that dimensional structure. And there's utility for all of those people. And so that's why you have to keep the dialogue going. It's like if you're hyper-liberal, you have to talk to the damn conservatives because sometimes they're right. Sometimes you're right. But sometimes they're right. And so if you don't talk, then the system tilts off to the, to the, to the extreme that's represented by that temperament. And so what you'd have is a bunch of liberals talking about new things while the buildings were falling down around them. <laughs> so, so we need each other. And that's, see, part of what's happened in the West is we figured that out a long time ago. And we figured out, oh, well, yeah, I've got to talk to those stupid people who don't think the way you do. Because sometimes, despite the fact that they're annoying and nowhere near as smart as you, they're actually correct. And so here's another way of thinking about it. Imagine the environment does this, like a snake. It's always moving, right? You don't know where the damn thing's going. And you want to be in the middle. It's like two cliffs. It keeps shifting. You want to be in the middle, far from the cliffs. It keeps moving around, and you're trying to walk forward. Well, sometimes it's over here, so the conservatives, they have to pull it back. And sometimes it's over here, so the liberals, they have to pull it back. And, but because it keeps changing, you don't know who's right. And so you have to keep talking. And that's, that's what a democratic society actually allows for. Exchange the opinions, move the damn polity so that we can stay in the middle of the snake, roughly speaking. And so you've got to have some respect for people who aren't like you. They're actually not like you. So I figured out recently, I think, that I couldn't figure out why openness and conscientiousness are the dimensions that are determining political belief. Because they're not even correlated. So why the hell do they clump for political belief? And I think I figured it out. I think it's because of, of borders. I think the fundamental political issue is how open versus closed borders should be. And I don't just mean borders between states. I mean borders between states. I mean borders between institutions. Borders between genders. Borders between sexes. Borders between ideas. The conservatives say, keep everything where it belongs because it's working. And the Liberals say, yeah, it's working for now, but unless we make some adjustments, it's not going to keep working. And they're both right. So we better have the dialogue, because otherwise we wander off the cliff, on the left or the right. And we know where that goes. That goes, there's flames down at the bottom of those cliffs. And people die horribly down there. And we've seen that on the right and the left. We've had plenty of evidence for that. So I've had like a bunch of smart sort of friends who lean to the left, and uh, I have, like, it feels like their compassion got twisted somehow, and I have compassion for that. I don't, I, like, I, I want to speak to to that, like, these are people that I love and stuff like this, and I think that they are kind of ideologically twisted, so I just was worried. Well, so, one of the things I've also spent a fair bit of time thinking about is the role of, that resentment plays in political ideology, and um, I have recommended in my lectures, but I'll recommend it here too. There's a great book by George Orwell called *Road to Wigan Pier*, which I would, W-I-G-A-N, which I would highly recommend. What Orwell did, he was a leftist. He went and fought with the, on the communist side in the Spanish Civil War against the fascists, roughly speaking. I mean, Orwell was a tough guy, and very, very smart, super smart. And he went up to visit the coal miners in the 1930s in in in, in northern in, in the northern UK. And I mean, those people, man. They had to crawl to work for two and a half miles in a tunnel that was like three and a half feet high just to get to their shift. And then, you know, that meant breaking rock for seven and a half hours. Then they had to crawl back and they didn't get paid for the commute. You know, so they had rough time. and They had no teeth by the time they were 30. And, you know, they were done and old by the time they were 40. It was rough. And so, you know, Orwell went up there and said, Jesus, the industrial nightmare is just killing these poor oppressed people. It's like, yeah, well, that's for sure. 
And he lays it out. You, you can't read that without thinking, A, thank God I'm not a coal miner. And B, yeah, it's pretty rough at the bottom of the Industrial Revolution. Like, seriously rough. But in the second half of the book, he did an analysis of socialist philosophy. And one of the things he pointed out was that his observation was that the sort of middle class, ideologically bound socialist types didn't care for the poor at all. They just hated the rich. It's like, yes, that's right. Not everyone. Not everyone. I worked for the NDP when I was young. And I met a number of the leaders of the NDP, including Grant Notley. I knew him quite well, who's Rachel Notley's father, because we come from the same town. And I had a lot of admiration for the leaders of the back then, you know, because they were really trying to give a voice to the working class. It's like, you better give a voice to the working class, or you end up electing Trump, for example. But, you know, the socialists have abandoned the damn working class. It's like, no, we'll go play identity politics instead. It's like, that worked out really well for Hillary Clinton, I noticed. So, because it was identity politics that certainly shifted the election towards Trump. She lost the working class people. Well, someone has to give them a voice. So there are genuine, there are people on the left who are genuinely working to better the lot of people who, because of situation, haven't had the opportunity they, they might have. But so many people are resentful. It's like, no, there's some people out there that have more than me. That's a terrible thing for a North American to think. It's like, we're so goddamn privileged that, you know, we should spend at least one extra day in hell after we die for every time we complain about how poor we are. Right. Oh, there's some people who are richer than me. Yeah, that's, that's pretty rough, man. That's, that's a rough break for you. You're still... It's the funny thing you hear about the 1% all the time in North America. It's like, oh, the 1%. First of all, that's a moving target. The people in the 1% shift like crazy. You have, I think, about a 10% chance of being in the 1% at one point in your life. And about a 40% chance of being in the top 10% for at least one year of your life. So, there is a 1%, but it's, it's moving. But you're the bloody 1%. All you have to do is compare yourself with the rest of the world. So, like, what are you complaining about? These tiny proportion of people who have more than you. Like, what's up with you? How can you be so clueless that, that you would do that? How can you be so ungrateful and arrogant and blind? It's terrible. I mean, people have rough lives in the rest of the world. I mean, we're making people richer very fast. You know, 300,000 people a day now get connected to the electrical grid, and about 250,000 people are lifted out of abject poverty. We're wiping out abject poverty faster than ever before in human history by a huge margin. So that's all for the good. It's really impressive. But, but a huge chunk of that twisted compassion is just resentment. So there's a few people who are better off than me, maybe, if I compare them to myself across one dimension. Jesus, dismal. 